you're listening to the Surgeons of Horror podcast. Hello, welcome to the Surgeons of Horror podcast. Its purpose is to dissect horror movies, one screen legend, franchise at a time. But it's also our job as Surgeons of Horror to look at those fresh and contemporary slices of meat that come our way. And this is no exception in a latest film that uh, myself, your lead surgeon, Paul Farrell, and my fellow host, Miles Davies. Hey, Miles. Hello. 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 Um, that we checked out not um, only just about a week ago, and it's um, at the time this podcast will go out, it'll be on general li- release. The moving question is called It Comes at Night. So it's a, a little-known film which uh, people might recognise its key star in um, Joel Edgerton from Australian kind of fame. And he's an interesting guy too. Like since he's been in like a lot of like these kind of powerhouse Hollywood films along the way. Yeah. He's been in these like lot of big powerhouse films, but when he has chosen the film, as in like if he's not relying on the paycheck coming in, his films tend to be gritty and dark. And this one is no mm. exception to that. Um He loves a thriller. He does like a thriller too, yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah so, even I mean even judging from his his um, uh, directoral, sort of American directoral debut with, with Gift, you yeah. know, it's, it's this, uh, you know, off the wall thriller, of, and and I, he seems to go for these really, you know, just edgy thrillers, basically the, yeah. the non formulaic ones. So the smaller the better, I think. He just likes to yeah. you know, take an audience on a twists and turns that you just don't quite expect. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I think it's fair to say that this one is on par with that kind of line of, mm. of that he's going with with the movies that he's starring in of late. Um what was your perception of the movie before we went in? Um personally, I I mean my perception all comes down to that amazing trailer that mm. that, that yeah. was online for ages. I noticed a lot of people are going into uh, commenting on the trailer on uh, the uh, film com- distribution company Village Roadshow's website, yeah, and they're all like, "We have to see this horror. We have to see this horror." And it's like, well, it's not really a horror, so it's yeah. kind of a little bit misleading in that way. Um, yeah, and I thought it was just going to be one of these sort of very formulaic sort of horror films, and that sort of I was half expecting like the um, the o- opening of the t- of twenty eight. Um, twenty eight uh, weeks later, yeah, yep. um, in a longer format, basically, yes. The, the yes. zombies coming and attack them and shit like that. So, but it was it was just drastically different to what yeah, they yeah, yeah. expected. Anyway, yeah. so it's it's hard not to kind of talk about this movie without the major spoilers at- attached. So we should probably, mm. I mean, uh, people that are listening to our podcast anyway would hopefully know by now that we do dissect these films, yeah. and in order to do that, we talk through the plot line. Um, but I think I think really we we kind of have to you know issue and this is definitely going to f- feature spoilers throughout and there's no way we can discuss it without re- no no that's re- revealing right. anything basically no 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 it's too difficult it's way too difficult so like mm. the uh, but it is fair to say that it's a uh, um, without going into too much detail that it's um, a post apocalyptic setting where the trailer kind of may mislead is that. There is this illusion that there's an outside entity encroaching in upon them. Yeah, that entity does exist, but it's an entity that's within the mind, not within a, a physical kind of being as such. Yeah, exactly. Um, plus, there is a known disease outbreak that's going on outside that nobody knows about, yeah. which is the reason why we find ourselves in the in the position we're in. So. Uh, let's just get straight to it and talk about the opening scene that we're faced with. Um, mm. It's 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 pretty brutal and full on. We we see an elderly man, um, and he's clearly kind of uh, struggling. He's disease ridden. He's he's wheezing, and he's being spoken to by what we learn is um, his daughter, and she's wearing um, an, those old traditional kind of gas masks that you would see on like doomsday preppers and things like that. Um, and she's encouraging him to say, you know, by saying, you know, everything's going to be OK. It's going to be OK. At which point her husband, um, whose name is Paul, and that's uh, played by Joel Edgerton. That's his character. Plus um, the son, Travis, who is, may I add, one of the standout performances in this film. Oh, yeah. Played by Kelvin Harris Jr. 
Well, we'll get to performances down the track. Um, and yeah, so uh, Travis and and his dad Paul basically put Bud into a wheelbarrow, wheel him out into the woods, uh, of which where they pour him into an already freshly dug grave. Paul, the husband, the husband, the father, puts a pillow over the uh, the guy's face and shoots point blank, killing him dead. And then they pour oil over the body and set fire to it. So that was an opener. That was the opener. Yeah. Um, reactions to that? Wow. You know, we we kind of walked in just as the guy was sitting in the chair and yeah. um, in the the waiting room essentially that they had mm. set up just near the door, and so it was kind of, I mean, it's so confronting from from the get go that yeah. you just kind of you, it sets the pace of this is what you're getting. Yeah. So it's and and you're in for a really dark ride. So there was no qualms about it. It was like this is it. This is going to be a this was it was going to be a very unsettling movie from the get go. So yeah. absolutely, absolutely. Mm. Um, so- I half you know from that I, I kind of I, I still question whether this actual. Um, I was saying in the back of my mind, I was like, I wonder if I wonder if this disease thing is actually real or yeah. they're you know just making things up because he doesn't look that sick. He just looks a bit wheezy and stuff. And, yeah, yeah. You know, like compared to zombie movies and stuff where you see him like jolting around and shit. But yeah, obviously they they knew his time was up. And, yes. And it was like bang, get him out, put him out of his misery, misery as quickly as possible. That's right. Because even mm. uh, even Paul's character says later on down the track, he said, you know, the the character in question is Bud, is the character, the older guy. Mm. Um, he basically says, um, you saw what happened to Bud. It came on him within a day. Mm. So I I kind of am leaning more towards your line of thinking in the sense that it's the paranoia that's making them believe that they are seeing things. The son yes. himself has these moments of delusional kind of uh things where he thinks he's getting sick throughout mm. the film and when he wakes up or from his nightmare and stuff he's he's clearly fine mm. um and so i i honestly think it's all in the mind and i the the key thing about this film is that it's 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 about paranoia and it's about control and mm. lack of control mm. throughout it and it's important and power is really really important the power shifts and changes yeah. quite yeah. a lot throughout this film um and uh integral to that is the character Paul because mm. he is used to having the power within the household yeah and uh we're going to not meaning to jump ahead too much because I will come back but um when another family comes and visits and there's another patriarchal figure in the mix yeah. suddenly his power is being questioned and I'll come to yeah. that down the track um, he's also because he's an ex teacher, yes. so he's he's used to being the the boss of the room. That's that Any room that he's in, he's the boss of that room, yeah. especially over the children in the room. So, yes. so, so he's kind of used to being that that patriarchal sort of that figurehead, basically. So, yeah. yeah. And mm-hmm. then when they have obviously when the other guy comes in, it's he's the you know patriarch of his family. Then and, that's right. So on and so on. So, yeah, yeah, it's um, it's interesting. Yeah, it's an interesting dynamic, isn't it? Really, really interesting dynamic. So, what we see then next is that um, the next scene is that we oh we we learn that there's a dog too. There's a dog mm. that, that um, the son's rather attached to, who's named Stanley, um, and he was kept away. F- uh, they've been kept away from the rest of the world. So, just to kind of reiterate, the family that's left is Paul, his wife Sarah. Their son Travis, and then this dog, um, and they're kind of shacked up in this kind of uh, cabin kind of place that's remote, set in the middle of the woods. Mm. Um, it's so remote you wouldn't you would kind of stumble across it really without knowing it's there, and all and it's all boarded up as well. So it kind of from the outside it would look like there's nobody living there. Yeah, and there's one room, one one way in, one way out. One way in, one way out. The red door. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yes, which is and it's always locked. And who has the key? Paul. Paul. Now that's yeah. really, really important. <laughs> oh. um, which we kind of will come to as as we come to the climax of the film. Um, so um, 
What we do learn, as I said, is that Travis, the son, is it does have a lot of nightmares. He keeps seeing himself walking into uh, a room in the house and and seeing this uh, sick, uh, wheezing man on the, on the bed. Um, whenever Travis approaches him, um, the man shrieks, and then that's when Travis wakes up. Mm. Um, and then we come to this point where the the parents realize there's someone trying to break into the house. And so uh, they come down, masks, masks are on, shotguns handy, uh, Paul leads the charge, um, he he goes in to what, essentially behind the red door there's like a bit of a porch area, Yeah. Um, and he goes in and that's when he sees that there's somebody there, another guy, um, and, um, and uh, Paul tries to question and, and quiz him, um, and then um, that's when uh, he basically um, knocks him knocks him out cold with the butt of his rifle, his shotgun, yeah. um, and the guy is down and out. Um, and this is the thing about control too. Like there's continuing that theme. The next bit is where Paul and Travis take the guy out and tie him to a tree um, out yonder, and Paul is watching him from within the house throughout the course of the mm. day and you just hear the guy moaning and yeah. moaning the whole way through which is like this really kind of like oh my god moment but again like it's the whole binding and you know fastening of this other character yeah. uh, to assert that control and now Paul's argument is that he's doing it because he wants to see make sure the guy's not well, sick quarantining him yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but they're not exactly quarantining him in a safe place no, so, no uh, not you know right. leading him out there just to if if he get, if somebody comes along, he's going to get eaten or whatever yeah. the, these disease people do. That's right. Um, he's going to t- get attacked first. And maybe they don't eat people. That's the thing. Maybe that's why they they leave him out there because they just kind of know that they're just the sick people are just just roaming around. Maybe yeah, maybe yeah. it's not like a zombie thing. Yeah, so. we, we never find that out, do we? Like he, even when um, Paul quizzes the guy later on. And he says, there's nobody around, there's no one. It's like Ugh. everyone's gone. So you never really... And that's the problem when you're isolated from each other and not connected, you do lose touch uh, of reality. And, Ugh. you know, you are you are left to your own resources. And then in doing so, uh, you question and imagine great things that could be happening beyond your Ugh. your internal sphere, you know. Um and that just heightens the tension even more so yeah off, off that so um what we do learn though is uh, in the morning they go back out and um paul um quizzes the guy uh, and basically says don't lie to me whatever you do you've got to you know promise me you won't lie to me or oh, i'll kill you we find out that the guy's name is will played by christopher rabbit again a great performance from this guy too mm. um and paul uh, basically um you know Paul basically just um, um, kind of learns from. Uh, sorry, I've just lost lost the guy's name. Paul learns from Will that um, he, he has a family, uh, a wife and a uh, son. Is it a son? Yeah, a wife yeah. and a son, and um, and he's gone looking because they've run out of water and and essentials. So he's had to leave them alone um and um he goes well where are you and he says at my um at my brother's place we're shacked up at my brother's place Mm. and so uh paul then kind of quizzes uh sits down and talks with sarah and travis and have a moment where they're discussing what's going on and there's a really good moment here about when um the way the camera is shot is that we're it's kind of focused on the sun travis in the middle of the two and he's pondering that and you kind of wonder whether what he's thinking and whether he's starting to question his parents actions mm. um you know he's seen his father shoot his grandfather at you know cold blood um yeah. you know so there's things going on in his mind and there's that's what I one of the things I really loved about this movie is that a lot of it feels like it's told from the son's point of view yeah i think it is actually i think you get that all the way through it yeah yeah it's it's, it's the world according to to the sun basically yeah, that's right and he's like he is the beating heart of this movie 
Mm. Every, everything mm. that's emotional that's not fear or rage comes from him. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, and slowly his world shrinks more and more because like, he's lost his grandfather and there's a moment later on where he starts losing other people and... Well, he loses the dog that he's close to. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so his world gets smaller and smaller because of that. Um, so, look, there's a... Um, yeah, so basically, like, they're having a chat and they're working out what to do. They decide that Paul will go with Will to um, uh, basically go and get the... Um, pick up the uh, the his family, essentially, and come back to the, to the cabin. So they kind of go back up. They decide to um, they go in like a like a Ute, um, and with Paul in the front and Travis right in the back, and on their journey, they um, they suddenly get shot at by these two people out of nowhere, and and um, the car goes careering off and crashing into a, into a tree, and at which point we don't see what happens to um, Will at this point. We're just getting it from Paul's perspective when he jumps out, he climbs under the under the car. And he sees a guy approaching and he shoots him, kills him, point blank. And and then he hears that there's a, a struggle going on. He finds out that Will's fighting another guy. Um, and um, at which point um, Paul comes up and he shoots the other guy too. Um, there is a moment there where Paul quizzes Will and says, do you, do you know them? Because there's a point yeah. where Will seems a bit defensive of what's happened. Yeah, I don't my I don't know where I ended up with that. Whether or not Will did know them or generally didn't, and was a bit I, more shocked. See, I don't I, I don't know. I don't think he did. Yeah, I think otherwise there'd be more of a reaction yeah. from him. Yeah. Um, the fact that he killed one of them, I think he just yes, he just didn't want. To, he's not a killer, basically, and isn't willing to go just kill someone cold blooded like as well as as as, as easily as Paul. He hasn't gone as far down that route yeah. as Paul seems to have gone. So no, um, so, I mean Paul's clearly killed someone before because he's killed his own father-in-law. Yeah. So um, yeah, I just think you know, given it a couple of months, and it, he probably would have been caught up with with um, Paul. But at that present moment in time, we all was just like, no, no man, no, we'll just leave him alone. You yeah. know, they were, we're all entitled to live, that type of thing. Yeah, but, that's right. And he was essentially just beating the shit out of him rather than, you know, grabbing a rock and or yeah. anything hard and really just doing some damage. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I, no, I, but there was, there's a suggest, suggestion, obviously, because it's still building up the paranoia with that. So, and the music kind of oh. ramps it up as well. So that was that sort of drum beat. Yeah, that's right. Of building up your heartbeat, building up into a sort of a paranoic state, basically. Yeah, that's right. So, that's right. Mm. And it's something that we haven't actually uh, touched upon yet, but something that was so integral to this movie and how good it was was yes. the music. Yeah. Um, so the, I think it was at, around this 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 moment when they were driving through the forest. Went, fuck this music! Music's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was. It's so good. And like, so yeah. I'm gonna sh- uh, shout out to the uh, composer for this. His yeah. name is Brian. McCormick. It really reminded me of um, Bear McCreary's um, music from um, Battlestar Galactica. Is that yeah, very yeah, primal yeah, yeah, yeah. drum beats and just really intense sort of. Um, building up a really intense emotion and background. Yeah. So it was, it was cool. It was very, very oh, cool. It was, to me, it was one of the mm. signature um, oh, yeah. pieces of the film. Like, mm. it's it's integral, and everything about it is tribal. Um, mm. It feels raw. It's got energy to it. That's um, it, isn't it? It's tri- yeah. We get on a tribal thing. Is, yeah. Is, you know, when, when everything breaks down, you resort to tribes. You, you yeah. start going in, but we're turning into tribes. And if eventually they they create their their tribe, which is their um you know their working tribe of that particular moment. But you know they're Americans and they can't get along with each other, so yes, <laughs> <laughs> you see what happens. Yeah, yeah. But um, there's hmm. something I wanted to add. Uh, you know, just going back to the story um, with that moment where uh, Will punch is punching the guy in the face. Paul shoots uh, the guy. That is quite. Um, important to what or, or an indicator i should say of what happens in the climax of the film yeah yeah um so just bear that in mind um, as we kind of come through this so um 
the two then like, eventually like will and paul kind of collect the wife whose name's kim and their son called andrew and um and part of the reason for uh paul and the family agreeing to bring them back is that they've got chickens and yeah. pigs so they've got food source yes uh to trade with so that's when they come back with everything and then the next kind of period is like a bit of like them kind of all getting to know each other it really is the honeymoon period isn't yeah it? Them yes. getting along and all you know making human contact again that's it and you know yeah <laughs> yeah yeah that's right and even like there's a great moment where travis sneaks up into like the attic space and he can hear um mm. you know uh, will and uh Will and Kim having intimate discussions mm. and they're kind of joking around and falling with each other and, and um, Travis has this moment where he generally laughs out loud at what they're saying and mm. he's enjoying the fact that there's company again. So, yeah, so you're right. There's like this honeymoon period and, you know, things aren't quite hunky-dory though because Travis is developing, he does start to develop a bit of a crush on Kim. Yeah. At this point, he's 17 years old. So he's at that point where, you know, he's... I think he developed a crush on a tree at that particular moment <laughs> in time if it had it the right curves, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's right. He has a dream where, um, he, uh, like, Kim walks in on him in, in her underwear. She kind of straddles him, um, only to then spew this kind of, like, black bile into his mm. mouth. Um, so it kind of goes from this kind of sexual kind of fantasy into... You know, disease, disease again, yeah. And uh, you know, in this, like, if we are going down the role of, of of it's all in the mind and paranoia, and 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 it's things that you shouldn't do or shouldn't think or behave like, and that's when you become infected. Mm. Um, then you know he would probably think I can't go there because, you know, if I do that, I could get you know I could get something or this whole kind of you know, um, inflicted kind of. Like As it I follows, said, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so the next uh, scene, I think he... Oh, yeah, so he then goes down, he gets up in the night, he goes down, he sees Kim sitting there by herself. Um, they hi, they kind of have a, a bit of a, um, a very kind of... quite uh, intimate chat with each other. Mm. Their guards are dropped and they are being friendly and there's a moment where it's... she's quite young as well she's, yeah, she she's not that much older than him anyway yeah. yeah and as she says she she says oh you're not much older than when will and i got together so it's yeah. that sort of you know you kind of if if they're your sole world you're kind of that age for the rest of your life you know and you get together at that 25 or if you get together at 17 with someone sometimes you, you kind of a 17 for quite some time yeah you know? yeah yeah so, yeah that's yeah. right absolutely so um but there is like a bit just at the point where it might turn awkward as in the awkward silence moment he he kind of retreats and goes yeah um i think he i think he catches he kind of looks she her blouse comes loose or something and yeah. he he kind of sneaks a peek, basically, yeah, and she yeah. catches him. Yeah. And that's when it gets a bit uncomfortable because, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. what's on teenage boys' minds. That's right. It's, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. <laughs> okay, so then uh, if we're moving on, like, the next night, um, uh, they, yeah, that's right. So Stanley, the dog, starts barking at something. Mm. And when they go outside to try and find it, uh, the dog just kind of tears off. Yeah. Uh, and then Travis panics and chases after him. Mm. So, again, this is coming back to, like, control and loss of control. At this point here, Travis loses control, and in doing so, Paul loses control of Travis. Yes. Um, and this is quite an important scene because of what follows, and if my theory is correct, then um, a lot of stuff is orchestrated by Paul throughout this in order to maintain the control he's got. Mm. Um, so Stanley kind of goes running off, and then... Um, uh, it's Will that catches up with Travis first, and Travis says he sees something, and you never see what it is. Yeah. Um, and then Paul comes, and they kind of has a bit of a go at him, and then says, "Look, we've got to go back." Um, and and they go back to the house, and they kind of he almost kind of has a go at Travis, and you know, and um, and that's when they um, uh, he kind of almost apologises to him a bit later on too. Um, and he just says, we'll go and find Stanley in the morning. I'm sure he'll be okay. 
So there's a point where uh, the two men have a scotch together. It's what it's the grandfather's old scotch. Yeah. And in doing so, uh, there's a bit of a slip of, of truth comes out from Will. Mm. He, or a bit of a slip where he says that he was uh, an only boy. Yeah. And Paul picks up on that and says, oh, I thought you said you had a brother. And he, and then there's a massive backtracking going on from Will's point of view. And he said, well, uh, it was my, it was my yeah. wife's brother. You know, he's my brother-in-law. He always felt like a brother. And so yeah. that's the seed of doubt that needs to uh, that comes into play, yeah. That, where Paul just starts to really question everything, and he even shuts down a conversation really quickly and walks off. Yeah. Um, and so you know that, yeah, the tipping point's about to happen. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Later on, like Travis is walking around, he sees Andrew, the boy, on the floor in the living mm. room, and then um, and Andrew doesn't remember how he got there. Travis then picks up the boy's hand takes him back into the bedroom of uh, of um, Will and Kim. Takes him back to the bedroom of Will and Kim, and, and he kind of looks at them for a little while before he then shuts the door and goes. And then that's where he hears the, the kind of banning going on. He walks around to where the front, uh, the back door is with the red door, the only one, one way in and out, and he sees that it's open. That's when he runs up to wake his mum and dad up and says, there's somebody in the house, somebody in the house. And mm. they kind of get themselves ready. They go down. Um... Paul and Will kind of get up and, and they go into the room on their own and that's where they see Stanley, the dog, on the floor bleeding. Um, and they kind of realise that they're going to have to kill it, basically. Yeah. Um, and so they kind of manage to shepherd Travis away. He wants to know what's going on and he kind of says, like, it's Stanley, he's 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 dying. Mm. Um, and so at which point then... Um, Paul and Will take uh, the dog out and they kill it, burn it in a grave again, similar to what we saw with Bud. Um, so in this instance, so where my theory is going with this is that um, he realises that um, he's losing, like Paul realises that he's losing control with that, so he needs to kind of almost punish Travis mm. in order to bring him back. And the only way he can do that is to punish someone that Travis loves in yeah. this instance, it's the only thing really left is the dog. Mm. Um, and so, um, so I don't like, that's my theory. I could be completely wrong, but that's where my head is going with that. Yeah. Um, and then, um, they kind of sit down to kind of discuss what's, what happened. So that's the two, okay. two families. Travis explains that he found a- uh, Andrew, the, the, the son of the other family, um, and what he did. And so they're kind of, um, uh, Will and Kim get a bit defensive of that. Um, Paul asks if if he sleepwalks, mm. um, and so yeah, the rift is starting to occur at this point. Um, and Andrew uh, says he doesn't remember getting out of bed. Uh, Paul at this point then uh, suggests that maybe um, both families should just not interact with each other for a while, um, because it kind of comes out that they question why the door was open. Yeah, um, and. Travis says that it was open, he just saw it open, um, but the other family think that maybe he was the one that opened it because mm. they know that he is often awake at night. Yeah. So there's a couple of things that goes on here. You question, you are questioning Travis' sanity a bit, but you also uh, question what's happening with the other people. Did someone else open it? And as we mentioned earlier, the only person that we know of that has the key to the door is Paul. Yeah, and again, this is why I think it's him all along that's playing. Yeah, everyone. Well, but that's right because he, um, you know, if he's the only one with a key, yeah. And what if um, uh, the son, like, he's not supposed to be up in the middle of the night, but he catches his dad doing something. Yeah, because he doesn't actually go into the room, so he doesn't. He just hears something with the door open. Yes, and oh, actually, no, because. Then he goes rushing into his parents' bedroom, and they're both there. So I don't know. Yeah, it's weird. <laughs> yeah, but then why on. would Paul leave the door wide open in the middle of, for him to find it in the middle of the night? I don't know. It just seems. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> you question whether it was Paul. I I, yeah. think, I think it was. I think it's all because he. I like personally, and again, I, this is my own theory, and I'm well. Mm. I would welcome anyone else to kind of contradict that if they feel they need to. 
the um but I feel like he has to he has to kill the dog. That's why it's bleeding. Yeah. Don't... Oh look it makes sense. Yeah. I'm just trying to think of the logis- logistics of the whole thing and Well if he then the moves he, well, like, he the then needs open to... in the middle of the night. Oh yeah. maybe maybe he he does it. Sets it up and because he knows his son is going to be wandering around in the middle of the night, yeah. and his son will alert him to the the fact that the dog's dying and the doors open. Basically. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So like, and also like, it raises suspicion on the other family. That's what he's willing yeah. to do because he yes. at this point doesn't trust Will anymore. Yeah. Um, and and there's another thing too. There's a bit of I kind of missed a bit earlier on, but Will shows Travis how to chop wood. Mm. Which is a very kind of like father telling son kind of moment. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And there's a point where there's Paul a bit of jealousy looks on there. and you could see there's a bit of jealousy in that moment. Yeah, yeah, and definitely. And so he can feel like his role as the patriarch is being threatened. Mm. Um, and so there's lots of things that come into play at this point here. And then, um, so yeah, so they decide to go uh, off the back of the truck. There's mistrust there. They don't know if either of them are going to be sick. So either Andrew's going to be sick or maybe Travis is going to be sick. So they separate themselves into two different rooms. Yeah. And um, and that's when um, they kind of isolate themselves. But then in the middle of the night, again, Travis gets up and he kind of breaks that rule, mm. um, which kind of question a bit why, if he's been told not to and they're isolating each other, why, why break that? But he's also having like these visions of, like he wakes up and thinks that his hands are riddled with disease and, yeah, you know, right. and that he's throwing up uh, black bile and stuff like this. So he's really at the point where he's becoming incredibly delusional about what's happening mm. um, within himself. And then, um, but he overhears Will and Kim talking, saying that they're going to be leaving. And he can hear that the boy, Andrew, sounds like he's in distress. Mm. And that's where he goes and wakes up his dad and says, you know, I think they're going to plan. I think they're going to go. So they make a decision to try and stop them or find out what's going on. So they go armed up with their shotguns again and masks on ready. And then that's when uh, Paul knocks on the door of the bedroom and Will seems reluctant to let them in. I think by this point it's fair to say that they really think something's not right. So if we, yeah. Because we never really see stuff from their point of view. It's very much from the family that we start with. Um, if you put yourselves in their shoes... They come to this house and then all of a sudden, like, you know, there's all this weird honest. shit going on. Yeah. And they never actually so show any signs of illness either. Yeah. Oh, I mean, apart from the kids sort of wandering around, but... Uh, yeah, but, sleeping. but I wonder if he did. I wonder if he was moved. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. Because he well, has uh, no memory of being moved. Like, he has yeah. no memory of how he got to where he was. Hmm. Will and Kim, we have to. If we take Will and Kim's face uh, face for it, that they, uh, or you know, that their son doesn't sleepwalk, that mm. suggests that somehow he was moved to the position. Yeah, that he, yeah, true. Um, um, so, um, yeah, so there's a moment where Will's reluctant to go in, but um, he does go in, and then, um, but is that is this the point where he's able to take the gun? He takes the gun off Paul, doesn't he? Yes. And they go and they go in, and then he gets him to take his mask off, and he sa- and he basically says to Will says to Paul, "This is what we're going to do. We're going to take what we need, and we're just going to go. I just want you to let us go." Meanwhile, outside the room, Sarah is still with the mask on and a gun, poised mm. and ready, waiting to get what's going on. Um, they slowly kind of leave the room. Uh, Kim takes Andrew in her arms and goes down these stairs, and um, Will starts to move. Uh, pull down the stairs too at which point Sarah comes out and basically says you need to drop the gun mm. there's this kind of uh, Mexican standoff moment mm. um, between them and tensions really kind of ripe at this point um, so there's a moment where they agree to lower their guns in, as they're talking and this is where Paul basically um, hits Will and then takes his, his gun back um, that's right that's what happens. So Will is unconscious and they're wheeling him out on the wheelbarrow. Yeah, that's right. And, um, and, it, and uh, into the woods and while Sarah has Kim at gunpoint at this point. Um, after Paul then dumps Will, Will gets up and then he starts to attack Paul uh, by bashing him in the head with a rock and mm. overpowering him again. Sarah at that point is, is a bit frozen, doesn't know what to do and um, she's caught, she has to act. And... She could. She does the only thing she can do, and she shoots Will. Yeah. 
in the gut, I think. And so he kind of collapses down onto the ground. Yeah. Um, and as Will is slowly dying, then Travis kind of picks up the gun. He scans to see um, Kim running off with Andrew in his arms and he just shoots. He's a bit bleary eyed because he's been punched yeah. repeatedly in the face. And we just then hear a Kim screaming. We Everyone's just hear Kim screaming. Kim screaming. Just an and then you, horrible yeah, scream. She's like, you know you, something's that, happened. That's right. And she's like, you've killed my son. You've killed my son. Mm. Um, and she says, kill me. She actually pleads with him to kill him at that point. Yeah. And so he goes up and he shoots her, point blank. And at which point Travis has then come piling out. He's been absent during this time. He comes piling out. And then we see that he starts um, uh, looking like he's coughing something up. Um, yeah. And uh, he, he looks unwell and, he, and uh, fluid starts dripping from his nose and he runs yeah. to the bathroom and starts throwing up. So we start thinking, OK, he's caught whatever the disease is. Yeah, and it yeah. cuts right, quite drastically to the next scene where it's done from his POV again where he's all bleary-eyed and his mum's sitting over him. It's a repetition of the first scene where she's yeah. saying to him, it's OK, it's OK, mm. everything's going to be OK. And basically kind of says, you can go now, it's OK. Um and then we see uh you know Travis walking through the corridor of his house with the lamp um going over to the window and then we hear uh um you know Sarah yeah basically it's just saying to to her son you can go now and then Paul is in the other room and he's just crying mm. um and the last shot we see is Paul and Sarah sitting opposite each other um at the table in complete silence yeah as then we just kind of snap to black and end mm. credits Wow. Yeah, full on, full on. Yeah. There was a point in that where I think where the the climax was happening and, you know, was, the guy's getting beaten up and Will gets shot and then, you know, then he shoots. When he shoots that gun and the wailing happens, I actually heard you audibly gasp. I did. I, I literally, I even had my hands up, like, going, oh! <laughs> <laughs> I literally was... Because I knew what was going. What as soon as that 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 shot fired, I went, "Holy shit, he's killed the kid!" Yeah, and I, yeah. I knew, you know, as a rider myself, uh, that was what I would do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, it's yeah. and I knew it straight away. And it was like as soon as that scream happened, and far out, Riley Keough is just such an amazing actor. Oh. He just absolutely nailed. I've never heard a scream. As horrible as as and as you know, that's uh, she just nailed that scene just yeah. in a, in a nutshell. You know, I don't know whether she, I don't think she's a parent, but she bloody you know, she she got it. Yeah, she, she really really got it. She's an incredible actor. Elvis's granddaughter, you know, and yeah um, yeah, yeah yeah yeah, and um, just so good in this film as she is in every film that she's in. I'm, yeah, I'm become a big fan of her since. Mm-hmm. Um, Mad Max and Girlfriend Experience, yes, American yes, yes. Honey. So she's just uh, absolutely nailed it with this this film again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a uh, all the like the performances are every single one of them just brings it, you know. Yeah, and they have to solid be, actors, just yeah. brilliant actors. That, yeah. That's all you need. It had when you think about this, the the plot for this, mm. it's really kind of slim. Yes, there's not much actually happening, but those people make it so believable. Oh like, yeah, you know, um, the Joel Edgerton, his wife uh, Carmen Ijago, I- I- is that name? Yeah, yeah um, I think so. Yeah, she's incredible. She's she's in that. Um, uh, uh, Ethan Hawke film Born to be Blue. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. About Chet Faker and uh, not Chet Faker, Chet, Chet Baker, <laughs> and um, and just incredible in that as well as, as Covenant, uh, Alien Covenant. As well. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, I was going to say she was in that too. Yeah, um, like, and just yeah. the two lead, the, the other family as well. Just yeah, right. yeah. So you know, Christopher Robert playing Will and R- Riley, as you said, playing um, yeah, Kim, and then as I said, the uh, you know also. Um, Kelvin Harris Jr. playing Travis. Yeah, he was um, great. Oh, he was so good, so mm. good. Um, and that's the thing, like, and I, they had to be because everything's stripped back. The ten, in order for the tension to be believable, they these people are at their most rawest, and um, and we need to see them. Yeah, you know, like I said, stripped back, and the, and the very essence of humanity is is laid bare. Mm. Um, 
throughout the uh, the telling of the story, and um, it's brutal. And so, like, if so if we play along with this theory, as I said, of mine of Paul mm. needing to assert control, it's almost like he realizes that he has to sacrifice Travis because he can no longer control him, and yet yeah. he can still control his wife. Mm. Um, but then, what's left? Like, don't have anything left. They, everything's gone. You know. Mm, yeah. Um, it's a it's a really bitter uh, bitter film. Yeah, it's. Oh, I mean, we, we walked out, and I was mm. like, that, I was like, that was a really unpleasant experience. <laughs> yeah. And I, you know, all week I've been I've been trying to figure out whether I like it. Sometimes I like it, and sometimes I hate it. Sometimes I like it, sometimes yeah. I hate it, and it's, I've had that reaction all week. And, you know, sometimes I think about it and I go, fuck, that was brilliant. And then sometimes I go, I get so infuriated by the film that I just go, no, nah, that's it. No, nah, I can't watch that again. Yeah, and, yeah, but, yeah. you know, I'll, get, I'll give it another viewing when it eventually sort of it, um, appears on, on online or whatnot and yeah. on um, Netflix or whatever. And, um, but, Jesus, it was, it, was, it was a rough, rough film. It, it was a rough was, film. And, and, you know, calling it a horror, I don't think it's a horror at all. I no. think it's just... Um, I mean, it's in the same category as The Road. Yeah. Cormac McCarthy's The Road. I was about to say that. Too. Bleak story. Yeah. About the the depths of humankind that that humans will re- re- sink to to yeah. to survive, and it's it's a survival story essentially. It is. But... It is a survival thing. Yeah. Mm. And so it's a, it's a fine line, isn't it? Like you know, it's not. I wouldn't say it's horror as a mm. genre, but it has the the subject matter are the mm. lengths of horror that, uh, or horrific yeah. undertaking that humanity goes to. Oh, it looks um, very clever at playing that, playing with a genre film yeah. and, and, and um, getting your audience in. To, and that that's, that's a, makes it a relatable experience. Yeah. You're going to discuss these things that are really kind of heavy things. And I heard somebody say um, that, it was the writer director's comment on cancer, basically. Oh, right. Um, and he, it, it, and that was what the disease essentially is: is yeah. the cancer and, the, and cancer being this epidemic that's around, and we're all trying to just survive from yeah. cancer because it's it just is so it's psychopathic, basically, and we'll just attack anybody. Sure. And well, uh, you never know who's going to get it. Black bile thing as well. Yeah. Way attuned to that, so. So uh, mm. I think his his dad died or something okay. of cancer. So it was it was him. Uh, I read in an article somewhere. Mm. And um, but yeah, the, if you're going to discuss cancer and that kind of you know how to how to move on and how to protect yeah. yourself from all to, you know live in a world of an epi- epidemic, which a pandemic, which mm. is what you know the cancer cancer is essentially. We're yeah. living in a, a cancer pandemic. And you know, uh, then you know, put it in a horror uh, genre film. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. That's right. Mm. That's right. Yeah, no, it's 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 gritty and it's yeah, it's really interesting stuff. My personal take on it was that I, I think I did like it. Um, I, I may have to leave it a little while if I were to view it again. Mm. Um, but I would recommend it. Oh, but yeah. you have to be in the right that right headspace when you go into. It, I think. Would you recommend it as well, or? I, I would. I mean, the, the next day I said don't see it, and then <laughs> the day after that I said, oh no, you have to see it. <laughs> so you've just been oscillating. I'm, I keep I keep fluctuating between yeah. I fucking hate it, and then I, I I absolutely love it. Yeah. But it's I've just said to everybody that I've sort of spoken to about it. It's not an easy. It's not an easy no, film to watch. It really isn't. You just, really you know, just. And I, and I keep saying, don't think about the trailer. Yeah. Just, just stop. Don't, stop thinking about the trailer because you will. And that's where the trailer was at fault, really, because yeah. it made you kind of get wonder when things were going to happen. Yes. The same as the trailer. Yeah. And and a friend of mine said said because he was there, he was in the row in front of us. Yeah. And he said. If you've seen the trailer, you've seen the whole film essentially. Right. Because all of the the scary bits are I mean, in the trailer. trailer. Yeah, 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 yeah. And but it's it's not that. It's more than yeah, the, the yeah. scary bits. It so is. by watching the trailer, by releasing such a fantastic trailer, it almost did itself a disservice. Yeah. By yeah. saying, oh, this this is the type of movie that you can expect to see. Sure. But then it's not. No, it's not. <laughs> it's a brilliant trailer. Yeah. But just not. 
it's it, it, I don't know. I mean, you got to get people to come and see the film. So yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I, I, work, I mean, I work in promos and advertising, so that's <laughs> yeah, yeah. What, uh, the way I would have done it. But geez, yeah, it was it was a little bit misleading. It was it is mis- misleading. I I have to agree with that, and it's um because it is about the journey between the scary bits that makes the tension. Yeah. So uh, mountable and and escalate. But again, how do you sell it to, to people? Are yeah. You going to sell yeah. that journey to people? Exactly. Gonna... <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. That's yeah, right. otherwise people weren't going to see it. So. No, no, that's right. That's yeah. right. Um, so the last kind of word we probably should do is that we actually haven't mentioned the director by name. His name's Trey Ooh. Edward Schultz. Um, so he's not just the director, he's the writer and he co-edited this as well. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah. So very hands-on. And prior to this, he'd only done one other feature-length film, which was called Krisha, um, which was also based on a short film we did called, of the same name. Um, he's definitely somebody to keep an eye on, I think. He oh, hell yeah. definitely yeah. knows how to tell a story with heart and and a lot of grit. Mm. Um, and I'll be keen to kind of see where he goes next. Mm. I haven't seen Krisha actually. I, I, I think I've I've had it on my hard drive for a while, and mm. I just haven't got around to watch, watching it yet. I will. I'm I'll not seeing it either, but it's billed as a it's billed as a comedy drama. So um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what that is, what that means. Though. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, cool. Uh, I think I'll, it, it's won a bucket load of awards. Yes. So yeah. Um, yeah, I'll be willing to give it a go and see what see what that's all about. For sure, so, for sure. Yeah, but if it says comedy drama, I'm not expecting comedy drama. <laughs> <laughs> it could be anything. It could be anything. Yeah. Cool. Well, I, th- I think that's probably us, buddy. Um, if, is there any yeah. final word you want to say on on the film? No, I, I think we've covered my, pretty much all of it. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Agreed. agreed. Yeah, I mean, I I, I I would definitely recommend it to people. So same. Um, yeah. Definitely saying oh, yeah. it's, it's, and I'm liking this current trend of where horror thriller films are going at the moment. Yeah, they, they have this kind of real edge to it, but it's also intelligence to them yeah. as well. Um, exactly, there's a good trend happening at the moment. Yeah, so um, yeah, so that's kind of um, yeah, it's, it'll be a good one to watch. Cool. All right. Well, um, uh, as I said, like um, this podcast is going out on the sixth of July, which is when it gets the nationwide release here in Australia. So, um, yeah, when you do come and uh, watch it, um, let us know your thoughts and send uh, send it across to us, uh, surgeonsofhorror dot com. Until then, I'm your lead surgeon and host, Paul Farrell, and uh, joined by the excellent Miles Davies. Thanks again, buddy. All right. Thank you. And uh, until next time, goodbye. Bye. You're listening to the Surgeons of Horror podcast. Music supplied by Peter Nezik. For more discussions or podcasts, head over to surgeonsofhorror.com or head over to our Facebook and Twitter sites for the latest news and updates.